It's March 19th, 2012, and we're here at Garwood Labs in Pico Rivera, California, just outside Los Angeles. The good folks at Garwood took care of our testing for the iPad and iPad 2, and today they're gonna help us with the new iPad. Let's go inside. I'm here with Sekla Lay and Steve Parra. Sekla, can you tell us how long you've been testing like this? Rick, I've been doing this type of testing for about seven years now. Great, and Steve, how about you? For about six years. Sekla, what standard are we following for today's test? Today we're going to be using an aviation standards document called RTCA D0160, revision F. Okay, well, let's get started. Okay, so here's the new iPad. Software on here is Jepson Mobile Flight Deck. I'm just taking a quick look, last second look to make sure everything's working fine. I'll repeat that test when we take it out of the chamber, so it's all yours. Okay, first we're going to put the iPad in the pressure vessel and seal the door. We're going to establish a base operating altitude of 8,000 feet and allow the iPad to stabilize at that pressure for two hours. Many people ask Jeppesen what's required to qualify a computer to be an electronic flight bag, especially one that was designed originally for consumer use. The lion's share of those requirements are included in two documents. FAA Advisory Circular 120-76A, which will soon be revised to version B, and FAA Order 8900.1. The FAA provides guidance about how the computer is mounted or secured for use during takeoff and landing. Recently, the FAA developed a very helpful document, AC20-173, that will help you with your installation of EFB components. For this class of EFB, three hardware-specific requirements must be met First, has to do with lithium ion or lithium polymer batteries. For devices like iPad, whose battery is internal, it must adhere to UL or UN standards. For devices whose batteries are removable or external, additional care and handling procedures apply. Certain tests ensure that the emissions from the computer will not interfere with airplanes avionics, including radio, navigation systems, and autopilot. These tests are done in a lab, on the airplane, or a combination of the two. But because non-interference testing is unique to airplane and avionics combinations, it's normally done on the airplane, both on the ground and in the air, following an industry standard checklist. Hey, we're ready for the big moment, the rapid decompression. Sekla, why don't you explain what's gonna happen? Sure, Rick. The iPad's now been cruising along at about 8,000 feet equivalent altitude for about two hours now. We're gonna simulate a sudden drop in cabin pressure by first isolating the pressure vessel at 8,000 feet. Steve's gonna do this by closing off the valve between the vessel and the chamber. Now I'm going to adjust the altitude chamber to 51,000 feet equivalent altitude. A lot of people ask, why 51,000 feet? Well, that's the maximum service ceiling of the business aviation airplanes that we service. By comparison, commercial airplanes are traveling more 30 to 40,000 feet. Okay, the iPad is still cruising along at 8,000 feet except now we have the chamber at 51,000 feet. We're gonna allow the iPad to decompress to 51,000 feet by opening this valve. This is gonna happen in just about two or three seconds, Rick, so get ready. We're just focused on the iPad to make sure everything looks okay. Everything looks normal, but we're not done yet. Sekla, what you looking for? Well, we want to make sure that the iPad hasn't suffered any damage as a result of the decompression. And it looks good. It also looks to be functioning fine also. Of course, it's up to the customer to make the final call on whether it's functioning properly. Well, we'll look forward to the report. In the meantime, we'll do some more testing on this. We're going to file this. We're going to archive it and label it, have it available in case it needs to be inspected. One more consideration as we wrap up. Now, this is between the operator and the principal inspector, of course. But Jepson recommends that if an EFB is involved in an actual rapid decompression event on an airplane, it's probably a good idea to remove that EFB from service, at least for use in critical phases of flight. 
This test is designed to show the ruggedness of a hardware model according to this depressurization. But in the abundance of caution, if one is actually involved in such an event, it's probably a good idea to take it out of service. Thank you and your team very much for your help today on this test. Our pleasure, Rick. Garwood Laboratories is pleased to support the testing needs of you and your customers. Well, we hope you found this rapid decompression test interesting today and that it answered many of your questions. Until next time, thank you.